Good evening, everyone. This is Bonnie Jean Feldkamp from the National Society of Newspaper Columnists. I am the media director for the organization. And tonight with us, we have John Avalon from CNN and Mary C. Curtis from Roll Call. Mary C. Curtis is a columnist at Roll Call, an award-winning journalist and host of the CQ Roll Call podcast, Equal Time with Mary C. Curtis. And John Avlon was previously the editor in chief of the Daily Beast and is now the senior political analyst and fill in anchor at CNN. And we welcome you both. Thank you very much for being here. Pleasure. We're super excited that both of you are going to talk about the art of the interview. And I thought we should start maybe with uh, talking about do you have a go to process for an interview before trying to approach? Print versus broadcast is very different, but interviewing is interviewing. And I'd like to hear how you approach interviews with uh, the intent for each medium. Hmm. Mary, you want to go first? Uh, sure. Uh, well, I think I do a lot of preparation. You want to do enough. You don't want to be surprised. You want to learn everything you can. You don't want so much that you get stuck and you have so much information that you don't truly, that you're not truly in the moment of the interview where you're listening, taking cues and observing. Uh, so I think that's the same for any interview, whether it's a print one, uh, whether it's, well, I don't do this really on air a lot, but I do the podcasts and I do some TV appearances and, and so forth. Um, so I would say just to start uh, that that's sort of my, my go-to. I want to know everything, but then also be in the moment and you know so you're not afraid to you don't miss things because you have a list of questions you don't miss opportunities for follow-up you don't miss opportunities to just let the silence sit and have the person be in the moment as well uh, so I'll, I'll start with that and then weigh in on some other thoughts john i certainly agree with doing your homework um, and, and among other things, it's not only you know your subject and you want to sort of empathize with their POV, but you try to avoid, as, I try to avoid asking questions that you already know the answer to because you can anticipate what they'll say. Um, I'd say the biggest difference between an on-air and, and, and a print piece for me, well, first of all, you've got a time constraint. So even if you're doing a relatively long form on-air, if I've got a sketched out series of questions I want to ask, uh, because Mary's point, which is exactly right, you want to remain in the moment where you are not simply thinking about the next question, but clued in, looking for a contradiction. I, I always think of it first, you want to be the audience's advocate, um, but you've got time constraints that really are key. So you may have your own, you know, roadmap, but it, it, it's, uh, you know, it, it's kind of like the old line, you know, make a plan and God laughs. You're not going to get the last question. So while sometimes you want to begin an interview building rapport, you don't want to extend that out where you miss the, the, news, the newsiest portions of the questions you want to get to. And you want to tier those questions, I think, so that you, you hit the ones that are really key and then, and then can, can back in um, into the stuff that's sort of nice to have. Um, but but the, the biggest frustration, particularly with on air, is inevitably there are questions you really wanted to ask that you didn't get to. And um, sometimes you got to stop folks from filibustering, uh, and and that's a whole different deal. On, on print interviews, uh, I, I find it. I mean, it's inherently looser, depending. You know, you don't you don't have a hard break in five minutes. Um, and um, I, I there, I mean, you know, there are two different kind of things. There's the interview where it's a little bit of a um, a, 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 a confrontational interview. And then there's telling someone else's story, but both should be bracketed, I think, with a degree of empathy. Um, even you know, if I'm interviewing someone like for my book Wing Nuts, which came out of a series of columns uh, about you know someone was comparing Obama to Hitler at an early Tea Party rally, for example, I would try to approach it and say, "What are you trying to say with that sign?" Um, because even if it's something that's sort of loathsome on the front, you want to build a, a, a rapport to get their own side. And, and that's, a, that's, that's an approach I learned from, from a bunch of Murray Kempton columns, and particularly one called um, The Southern Gentleman, which is one of my favorite columns, where he interviewed an early KKK, um, uh, well, a guy who was, who was basically trying to form a white supremacist organization in the South of Louisiana. And he did it. Um, he let him hang himself with his own words rather than demonizing him up front. 
Yeah, and I, I agree with uh, John, you have to be really strategic in how you tier the questions and plan them. You don't want someone to uh, cut off you know, the, the, the line of conversation in the beginning. At the same time, you don't wanna mislead and you wanna ask the tough question. And I maybe call me a glutton for punishment, but for a long period there, I was uh, doing a lot of interviews with people that you wouldn't expect a black woman to be in the space with. I covered Glenn, Beck, Glenn Beck's national rally on the mall, uh, the first national tea party convention uh, in Opryland of all places. I was and there I, too, I think that's where I first met you. <laughs> and I did, did a uh, long form narrative that won the Thomas Wolfe Award on Confederate heritage groups, which sent me into the field at different uh, restaurants, gatherings, meetings in which they did not have the American flag there. They had the Confederate flag. They signed Dixie and they ended with a, a Dixie yell. The first time that happened, I, I will admit I flinched. Um, and where people would say things, referring to what John said, such as uh, Abraham Lincoln was a war criminal and a tyrant who deserved what he got. Um, and I would like, I really was interested in hearing what people have to say. And I quickly learned that people want to tell you their story, they just do. And so even when I went into spaces where they would initially be a little apprehensive, at a certain point, they would want to tell me their story and convince me. Um, and in some ways being a black woman helped because at a place like the Tea Party Convention, they want to convince you that they believe what they believe, but not because they're racist. So mm -hmm. they be in a sense, very nice. Um, and uh, so that was very, interesting to me and I got to be in those spaces. Uh, as he says with broadcasts, uh, it is, and I found this with the podcast because I do like to get rapport with people, especially in different spaces like that, is you do have the time constraints. And sometimes as when, sometimes you can convince them to push it when I do it, like when I interviewed uh, Representative James Clyburn the, the, after he had been uh, uh, on the floor of the house all day and had been elected majority a whip, uh, and he said, "Oh, I'm exhausted. I'll give you 15 minutes." And you know, at the end, I kind of had to stop him <laughs> because you know. But then again, we'll get into it later. But I I brought up because I had met uh, his wife who died a year ago and was his confidant. So when you, you know, well into the interview, when you start asking, "What would Miss Emily think?" and he starts saying, "Well, she knew it all along. It was going to be Biden Harris." then that makes him warm, uh, warm mm -hmm. up. So um, yeah, you, you, you really have to think about being casual about things. <laughs> yeah, that's such an important point. Looking for, for ways to really connect and, and, and get a person to drop their talking points is, is one of the most important and difficult things. And by doing your homework and by finding those points of personal contact or asking questions, to take people off their their game, mm -hmm. um, uh, and those can be, you know, as simple as you know, you know, sometimes throwing in a what, what's your what's your favorite, you know, what are your, what are your top five favorite albums, you know, or, or favorite music or movies, something like that, that just gets them a little bit in a more genuine space, because otherwise, a lot of folks, particularly politicians, will default to talking points, and then it's kind of a waste of, of everybody's time. Um, oh yeah, their default mode. So you got to find a way to to, to to coax them into human land. And sometimes that involves putting yourself in, but even that has to be very limited because it's not about you. And so mm -hmm. you have to draw them out. But I do, uh, when you talked about talking points, when I was interviewing the mayor uh, of Charlotte by Lyles and um, she, uh, I was asking her about Kamala Harris and what she felt about the history of it. And she was talking about talking points. And it wasn't sort of getting what I wanted to get to until I said, okay, it's not Mayor Lyles and Miss Curtis, it's Vi and Mary. She's a black woman up there, really. What was in your heart of hearts, you know? And it was, eh, you know, I kind of flinched a little bit, but she, it was like, how do I break through mm -hmm. politics speak? And she really did relate to that. And I know her well enough that I knew she would not be offended, but. You have to be, you know, like I said, I don't like to bring myself into it, but since I do write about the intersection of politics, culture, and race, uh, occasionally that is going to come up just because uh, if something comes up naturally, I don't want to ignore the thing that is sitting in front of you. Um, 
but you do live for those moments. Say when Reverend William Barber starts singing you his favorite song and asking you to dance. I'm like, okay, now this is gonna be a great interview. <laughs> That's right. I have a question about um, the comfort level since you're speaking of, of getting people to loosen up a little bit. I've never interviewed somebody on the air, but I've been on the other side where I've been interviewed and it and sometimes they'll prep you and okay, okay, this is, we got five minutes, we're gonna hit this, 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 and this. And other times you go in cold. What, what is the benefit and when do you wanna make them comfortable ahead of um, an on-air interview versus when is it better if they're a little uncomfortable coming in? Well, I mean, for, for me, I mean, look, I don't think there's any anything wrong with saying here are the topics I wanna hit on. And I think, you know, uh, you know, the interview is going to unfold as it does, kind of like an ice cube melting on itself. But, but you know, if, if you've done that, you don't want to be duplicitous. You know, you, you want to be honorable and consistent. That said, obviously, but I'll just say it anyway, uh, you, you don't give questions in advance ever, even and especially if they ask for it. You don't agree to preconditions of not uh, talking uh, about a specific question. Um, and and um, and you really there are to be sort of the uh, the, the the audience's uh, advocate, but you know you you can break the ice with humor, um, and 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 trying to establish some degree of personal rapport. But if you're going in for a confrontational interview, you know there are ways to there are ways to do that um, while while still keeping um, you know decency and, and and civility. You just can't. Let them get with get away with BS, and when you hear that, you got to pounce and be ready for a question that's pointed. And by pointed, I mean one of the big mistakes you can make in an interview, particularly on air, is by making it too broad, because then they can choose to answer the part they want. A short question is tougher to wriggle out of. And I think too, tone is a part of it. Um, as you can hear, you know, John is, you know, the he's he's a you, you look at him, it's like, okay, I want to answer this person's question. Um, I think I'm an approachable person. It's, it's, you can say things in, uh, that are tough in a way that, as, as John said, is very specific, but also that it's not in a confrontational way. Um, and I think that that gets me a long way as well. Um, and uh, yeah, so and when, it was interesting when I was covering all these very odd, uh, counterintuitive kind of places, I really liked to talk and chat with the person a little ahead of time, um, you know, and so they knew me a little bit and it made them less reflexively mistrustful of press, which many of these people were. Um, they think you're coming in there to get them. So when you start off not being dishonest, but just being, uh, an approachable, kind person, then it's uh, they're less able to come back at you in a very confrontational way because it does seem out of proportion uh, if you ask them a question in a cordial way and they come back hard. And people have done that and listened to themselves. Sometimes they stop themselves short. I, I was really surprised by that. Mm -hmm. Curtis Honeycutt, who is actually one of our board members and he's a humor columnist, he wants to know what's the best way to break that ice with someone you're interviewing. You, John, you mentioned what's your favorite albums. Do you guys have a favorite question you like to ask somebody to just kind of loosen them up? I wouldn't begin with that to be clear, but, <laughs> but humor is always good. The humor columnist would probably kick both our butts on that front, but humor is good, Mary. Yeah, I, I actually, it's kind of, it's a question I ask people. Sometimes it's the last one. Sometimes, uh, you know, if I feel they're going cold is what is a question that I haven't asked you uh, that you wish that I had because you have some really important things to say on that issue or something you want to say. Uh, and often I get very heartfelt, uh, personable kinds of answers on that. And in Clyburn, I, I got a very tough one uh, when he talked about African-Americans who voted for Trump and what he felt. He gave you a little bit of history lesson about South Carolina, and it was a stunning answer. But uh, I find that that kind of opens people up because there's usually some burning issue on somebody's mind or something that they're passionate about and they want to share it with you. Mm -hmm. Well, Suzette Standring, you both know her, 
Uh, she says, you have great insights into breaking through resistance, but have you interviewed people who just won't drop their suspicions or presumptions based on you're out to get them? And how do you deal with that? Well, I mean, I, I find one, one way to do it. And look, I, I think we've seen over the last 10 years, not just hostility uh, to the press grow uh, often along partisan lines, but, but frequently, um, I mean, just a, a, a refusal to talk to the press. Um, and, 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 and so when, when you do get someone, um, which, which is obviously very difficult, the other thing I think we've seen in recent years is um, a, a refusal to acknowledge facts, which itself is a very insidious technique. Because right there, um, it, it, it's, it borders on a waste of time, but, but it's still not, because if they're sitting down with you in real time, you can, you can try to hammer that home. But if you say, look, you said this, or this person said this, and isn't that a contradiction? And, and they'll just reply by you know, ignoring all that. Ignoring all the facts, that's difficult. So one way to, to to bridge that stuff, especially up front, I find a question is is to quote them back to themselves, um, and that requires again one of the key points: you got to do the right homework. But if you quote someone back to themselves, or if you frame a question with, you know, I understand that you and many many of your supporters might believe this, but other people would say this, you know. Because so so you're not coming at it in a hostile way, but you're confronting with facts, but also an understanding that a you've done homework, b a degree of, of empathy with their POV, and that's more likely to draw them out of their corner. Um, and 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 that's I think that that's one technique. Yeah, that, it's tough though because sometimes even as John knows, when you nowadays confront someone with say their own words or someone there that they support their own words, they will basically deny they even said it. You could even show them the tape. Mm. <laughs> and I'm sure you've had that happen, John. Um, sure no, I love, and, I love it on the tape. Yeah, yeah, I mean, it, it, that is just tough. And you, know, you have to admit, sometimes you just aren't going uh, to get through. Um, and uh, you know, I've also been into spaces where it could be, you might feel at certain points uncomfortable to the point of danger, where you know enough to take yourself out of that situation. Um, but generally, I think, you know, the empathy piece and just sometimes asking people how they're doing, how's their day or how's their family or something as corny as that. Uh, will break them down a bit. But uh, you do have people, you know, I've had people at the different rallies, uh, you know, just refuse to speak. But generally, I've found that most people, as I say, just want to be heard. And if you give them that, they're so used to people um, talking at them or disregarding them or disrespecting them that, you know, you don't have to agree with them, but just say, I, I noticed this, or you said this, or you're wearing this when I go to different rallies and ask them about that. Um, it's, I usually, as I said, maybe it's because I don't seem like a threatening person, um, but people you know, will, will speak to me. Um, and others, sometimes you are confronted with things that are so outrageous uh, that it's difficult to- and, and Yeah, and, 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 and to that point, you know, so 10 years ago, and, and Mary and I both talked about covering the early Tea Party rallies. Um, you know, I forgot who said this, but one of the most terrifying thing in the world is everybody has their reasons. And, and, and that can include, you know, everyone wants to think of themselves in, in a positive light. I mean, so if, if you study the extremist groups or studied the Civil War, I mean, you know, folks believe that are, are absolutely convinced they're fighting for liberty, constitutional liberty, even as they're defending slavery. To use just one example. Um, so it, it, in the Tea Party rallies, what I found interesting is that when I went up to someone holding a sign that said, you know, compared to Obama to Hitler, um, I, I'd hear a couple of different things that in aggregate was very illuminating. First of all, they, to Mary's point, they very much wanted to be understood. Um, and they did not think they were doing anything wrong or they thought of themselves as being a provocateur. But what they would say is, well, a couple things. One, um, 
you know, they called Bush Hitler. So I figured it was fair game, right? So they do that kind of what about as a mother. Uh, other things I heard early on, it was really interesting because it, it wasn't, uh, it was a common thread that was in contradiction with the alleged purpose of the protests early on, which were remember fiscal discipline. Uh, I'd hear a lot of things like my family's been here for seven generations. Uh, and, and, and that spoke to about an anxiety, I think, um, of the, their family had been here and they weren't getting the opportunities they felt they deserved, right? And the way that uh, Obama was a, uh, an avatar for a changing America um, and they maybe felt that they were getting left behind. Another thing you'd hear a lot, you'd hear a lot of people bring up on their own the date 2040 or 2050, uh, which is when they believed the census said America would become majority minority, even though immigration wasn't, you know, and, and, and those demographic changes weren't ostensibly what it was about. So letting people talk, um, you know, even though they'll put the best face on, on their, their beliefs, 99% of the time, um, in aggregate, it's really illuminating uh, still. Yeah, and um, talking about bringing yourself into the conversation, sometimes I would not confront them, but try to be very disingenuous when they would say things like, uh, why do people say that we're racist? Uh, I'm not a racist, they ask me that. I'm a journalist, but I'm a black woman. And I would say something like, well, well, maybe, you know, when you are cheering Tom Tancredo when he says uh, that Barack Obama was a avowed socialist uh, Marxist uh, put in the White House by people who couldn't spell the word uh, vote or say it in English and you cheer, they might think that you're, <laughs> and I said, well, have you thought about that? You know, and sometimes they would say, hmm, you know, um, you know, point out the contradictions, but, you know, I would do that occasionally because like I said, I don't want to put myself in it, but sometimes I wear who I am when I go wherever I go. And so people sometimes will, will try to draw you in. So I try to be above it and apart from it. Um, I do that sometimes by thinking of myself, not as I know who I am. I'm a very shy, good Catholic girl, but Mary C. Curtis is this person who's out there and has permission to be in the middle of chaos. Um, and that helps me too, where I, um, I'm able to ask questions that I can listen to myself, ask them and say, I can't believe you asked that person that. Um, so that's a little trick I do where I make myself a different uh, Mary Curtis and, uh, and it works sometimes. <laughs> and, you know, I'll, I'll add one thing that it's a difference between on air and, 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 and uh, a print or you know, digital column. Um, you know, if you're on air and, and you know, it, and, and all of a sudden somebody starts saying something that's fundamentally false. Um, I think, you know, you want to hear them up, but you also don't want to give them so much time to just spread total disinformation. And it can be difficult if they're actually buying into a conspiracy theory that's baseless, but they're totally bought in. You're not going to convince, you know, you're not going to, uh, in that moment, you're, you know, you can't reason someone out of something they weren't reasoned into. And so there, there's a difficulty because you really do need to be like, hold on, let me stop you right there you know, that's not factually true. Why do you believe it is? So right there, you know, the, you are taking on a necessarily confrontational role to avoid the spread of disinformation. Um, in, in a print role where, where you don't have those sorts of immediate obligations, you may try to tease out those things. But again, your, your real responsibility, particularly in a column, and I love the reported column, it's my favorite form. Um, and so I mentioned Marie Kempton, Jimmy Breslin. I mean, you know, there are lots of folks who do it. Mary, Mary does a reported column very often too. And um, uh, it, they're the obligation is to tell someone else's story. And, and so there, there's really a lot of listening and drawing out. Um, and, and sometimes it's a, it's a confrontational piece, uh, sometimes the degree of empathy, uh, we're trying to understand their POV. Other times it's really telling someone's story who is not a public figure at all, but their story becomes important and emblematic of a larger issue. Um, and, and that requires a, a, a an, an, an artistic level of empathy, because you want to get a sense of who the person is and draw that out and be able to capture it on the page. Yeah, it really is a different challenge. Um, it's difficult, I'm finding it, and the when to confront and when not to, which you know, I just did, a, you know, Franklin Graham said Joe Biden is, it can't receive communion because, uh, you know, he is not pro-life. And I said, well, actually, I'm a Catholic and he can receive communion just because I felt that I couldn't, as John said, let 
something I knew to be false stand. Um, mm -hmm. I do love the column form because I, I love the reported co column because you can put the person in, you put uh, a lot of reporting in. And I also like to, uh, particularly it's been such a challenge this year uh, and an opportunity because so many more people are interested in uh, issues of justice and equity. Uh, and so when they see something happen with George Floyd, uh, when they see these issues, they realize, or when they see so many more black and brown people being uh, affected by COVID and by economic instability, that this isn't something that just happened, that it actually was systemic. So I found it really an interesting opportunity to bring in a bit of history with things like that. Uh, a history of, you know, why is there housing inequality? Well, there were restricted covenants, all of these things. Uh, and that's been uh, for a columnist in this audience, just an incredible opportunity to do a little bit of history, some reporting, uh, a little bit of experience, and it can make for a very rich and deep column. And I think now readers and viewers are open to that more than they may have been, just because they're more aware of it because of these in your face uh, events that have happened that you know, African-Americans could tell you that the uh, problems between law enforcement and the communities they cover, they cover have been there for a long time, but now people are saying, oh, I get it. Uh, and I think it's up to us to, as columnists, as journalists, to use that opportunity to learn more ourselves and actually take a look at ourselves. Uh, when you talk about the interview, when you're doing your research, um, I think the mistake that journalists can make, whether it's a broadcast or a, a print column, is to, assuming, uh, to assume what your audience is, that, that they're all like you. Um, mm -hmm. And so you have to be careful not to, in your questioning, in your interviews, and also in the resulting product, not to uh, limit it to that point of view. Uh, and I think we should do some self-examination as well, because the interviewer is bringing something into it as well as the person we're interviewing. Yes. I think that, um, like you said, Mary, the, the, the ability to tie personal experience to current events is so powerful right now. And, um, and I think people are more tuning in to that perspective as well. Um, I have a question here from Charles Summers, who is a student in the DC area. He says, a lot of my interviews are with local bureaucrats and transit officials, which at sometimes limit my ability to research the subjects beforehand. Do either of you have any advice for conducting a good interview without having ample knowledge of the subject? Any advice for Charles? Well, I'd say it's incumbent upon you to bring yourself as much up to speed on the subject. Um, you're not going to understand necessarily what that individual may do, although there's a common sense degree of empathy. And part of what you can do to, br to bridge that gap and to build a rapport is to ask them what they do. Um, and, and, and that will often be, but it'll show genuine interest and that's a way of drawing them in. But, you know, you need to learn about, in that case, like the DC transit system. Um, it doesn't need you need, need to read or write a dissertation on the subject, but you need to know what you're talking about and know what the the main issues are. Um, and, and that does require going deeper than you know, a Google uh, search or two. Um, some of the stuff's harder, tougher to research than others, but it, 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 and it's one of the reasons why I think the death of local reporting has been so difficult. The reason I smiled when I heard that is that's great you're doing that. Because guess what? Very few professional journalists are doing that right now because Metro beats and let alone specific Metro transit beats have been gutted. And so there's a real opportunity for young journalists and starting out or journalist period to, to, to form real narrow areas of expertise. And you can, you may be able to break real news that matter to a lot of people. Um, you know, it may not be national news, but, but th there's a certain filling into the gaps. And, um, and, and I think it's wonderful to be focused on that stuff because, you know, if, if you're, if you're covering night court, I mean, traditionally that's how a lot of journalists got their start. They're great stories. there, great human stories. Um, sometimes it's a big story. Uh, but but it's a great way to, to 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 cut your teeth on exactly that kind of that kind of stuff. Yeah, never be afraid, as John said, to ask someone in any interview to explain something. Don't act like you know what a term is if you're not familiar with it. Uh, one, as I said, people 
love to explain what they do, but also if you don't know something, just admit it and ask. And research, research. Uh, you know, they, the old movie wailed, you know, all of the president's men, but when they had the scene where they're in the library, you know, looking up records, the whole issue of public records kind of reporting, so many great stories there. Um, and then you'll go into an interview with so many facts that people won't expect you uh, to have. So, um, you know, that's always a great thing and to do that research uh, and to, to know what you're talking about. I, I had an ambassador on my podcast, African-American woman who had been the ambassador to Malta and she had formed, she'd been in the foreign service since the eighties and it formed an organization to get more minorities and women into the foreign service. And I talked to her because the Biden Harris administration is putting it together. And it was scary for me because I did, I, I know a lot more about domestic policy than foreign policy, I will admit, and national security issues. So I really, really, really worked really hard and studied it um, just because I didn't want to, I wanted to be able to ask informed questions. So uh, I've been doing this for a long time, but there's a lot I don't know. And so, you know, part of that is admitting what it is you don't know. I think that's one of the great things about journalism. This is not about having all the answers. It's about asking the questions to provide the answers to the public. And that's kind of our job. And, and on that kind of vein, especially with we're in a pandemic, people are Zooming, if we're not phone calling, there's definitely emergence of um, email questions. Can we do an email interview? And I'd like you guys to talk about that and um, how much of that is really speaking to the insecurity of the inexperienced? And what are some advice of, of getting over that and, and being willing to go beyond, let me email you some questions and we'll get some email results and I'll put together a a column from there. Because I, I do see, and I see that requested on the other end. Can you email me the questions and we could do this by email? No, we really need to talk on the phone to get to know one another. What are your feelings on, on that? My feeling is it's better than nothing but barely. Um, uh, you know, and, and look, I understand why people, um, you know, especially if they're nervous about being misquoted and all that. Um, but, Frankly, most often they should just be, they're just nervous. Um, and um, I think it's better to say, hey, why don't we have a, a, a background conversation first? And, uh, and then, you know, halfway through say, let's can we just go on the record for a little bit, um, you know, so try to make them feel comfortable. That they're not going to be on the hook for being themselves. And then, um, uh, and, and that's one way to, to build, build rapport because frequently it's to, sanitize and, and and you know in some cases you can even say look you know I'll, I'll 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 call you back with um you know making sure that you got you quoted them accurately and it's one way to make them feel they don't need to write it on the front end because you're not going to get a, a really authentic um authentic answer yeah i mean yeah the, the email questions no, um, <laughs> not at all. Uh, and generally just if you keep pushing and pushing and pushing, you know, the phone, the Zoom, whatever, uh, you know, uh, yeah, I, I agree with John on that. Yeah. We have another question from Rick Horowitz. For an interview that is not on camera, um, are you taking notes on what they're saying or are you relying entirely on a tape recorder and asking and taking notes on other things, room details, facial, facial expressions, et cetera. Oh well, yeah, I mean, go ahead. Yeah, no, I, 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 go, on, go, go on, John. No, I, I, a tape recorder is, is, is basic, but you should keep simultaneous notes to help remind yourself of what the significant things were and those other details. Because ideally, um, Again, this is something that like the, the great, I think, reported columnists can teach us when you read them. Uh, and one of the reasons why I did the, the anthology Deadline Artists is it, you're trying to set a, a tone and, and paint a picture. It's not simply a transcript of a conversation or, God forbid, just your own opinion. Um, you know, you, you really want to take that extra step into to, to, to making a moment come alive for people in the mind. It's one of the reasons I think some writers trained as painters back in the day, and, and I always find they, they, they write very differently. Um, uh, I, I did not, to my detriment. <laughs> oh, I love, I mean, there were a while, while there, you know, early days, I took just notes and 
So I, it, when I use a tape recorder, you can depend on it too much, but I always am taking notes. I am, uh, you know, as you say, making observations, but also uh, taking notes of things they say that I want to emphasize. And I had a, a journalism professor in college, and he was uh, Harry Arrow, an old time journalist. And he always talked about some of the best quotes coming when you, you know, turn off the recorder and, you know, put the book away and you're talking and they don't understand that you're still, you know, uh, doing the interview. Um, and, you know, I can remember I was doing a, a narrative story uh, on one of the folks who was a secret service person for uh, John F. Kennedy. Uh, and he was assassinated and he has since he was in a facility so he had Alzheimer's. So I did it with his family and how the family connected with the Kennedy family. It was a really interesting piece. But in order to first do it, I had the, his wife made me meet with all of their children. Um, and if they had to trust me first. And as a result, I would spend just, you know, when I started, when they said, oh yeah, she could do it. And I would do uh, the interviews and be in their family's homes all the time and spend so much time with them. And I can just have so many times I would, be talking with them and then excuse myself and go to the restroom and you know <laughs> write things down and all of that. Um, that made them comfortable. Um, and I wasn't being dishonest because they knew I was taking notes at all times. Um, so, there, you know, as John knows, you, you find all kinds of ways to do that interview, even if sometimes it's not conventional. Now, what about if you're on the air? So John, you mentioned that um, it's always best to quote people back to themselves when they're not being accurate. How do you do that when you're on air? It's not like you're, you rely on memory. Can you write, take notes while if well, somebody is doing that? It, it, you know, look, I, I do think in some cases it's incumbent upon an anchor to be a real time fact checker if folks are lying. That requires knowing your subject and, and doing your homework. And you may not quote them um, back directly, but you can get it approximate. Now, the problem, as Mary said, is some folks will just deny it. And, and so, you know, I actually think one of the best uh, interviewers is, uh, was Tim Russer. And so I actually spent a lot of time watching old clips of his interviews, um, which are, are not organized in, in as comprehensible form as they should be, given how good they were. But very often him, and you can see, he would, he would prep out the interview and stage it out. And he had a, a good block of time to do it. He controlled that show and the medium, they were sitting down with him. It was also a time when, um, you know, uh, you know, politicians always lied, but there, there were perhaps less shameless or treated shamelessness not as a virtue. Um, but, but, but then, you know, they'd say, you know, he, he'd ask the question, hesitate, and then say, actually, you know, let's play this clip. And, uh, and, and, and structuring it so you have the clips ready, if it's that kind of an interview show, that's, that's pretty, that's as effective a technique as there is because it's tough to wriggle on it. Not impossible, but tough, but that's structural. Yeah. Otherwise it's gotta be, uh, uh, you have to have the ability and the homework uh, and have done the homework in order to be able to, to fact check in real time as much as possible. Um, I, I, don't, I don't think, not enough folks do that, but I think it's essential. Some folks do it very well. And you also have to have the, um you know, the ability to ask the same question if they don't answer it. Um, mm -hmm. Particularly politicians are very uh, skilled in saying, you ask a question and they have the three things they're gonna talk about and they keep saying it in different ways. And you see some of the journalists, I just recently saw an interview that uh, Callie Jackson did on NBC, I think. And it, she did it in a very artful way that she asked a question and the person obscured it and she said, but, and she asked it again, uh, and the person never did really answer it, but it was very clear that the person didn't answer it. So uh, it was very skillful in the way she, she never came off as being disrespectful, but she wasn't gonna let the person get away with not answering the question. Uh, and so, and that's a really uh, great skill as well. And, and the, to that point, the follow-up the follow question is key. Yeah. It's actually an obligation. You know, you, you don't just let them get away with with trying to spin their way out of something. Definitely, yeah. That's what that's what comes from the listening. If you have a, a set of questions and you go on to the next one, like you said, you'll miss the part about you know, an Obama's Hitler. That's okay. The next question, you know, um, 
Uh, and, and that's hard uh, to do when you have that time constraint and you want to get everything in. But sometimes you have to know it's going to go off in a space. But if you don't, you'll listen back to it and say, why didn't I ask? Oh, how did I miss that? Why didn't I ask that follow up? And I've done that myself, but it's a learning process. Uh, yeah. Now, Mary C, when you're recording a, a podcast, how much of the, the while you're in it note taking or flipping through your notes, audio is such a concern, just being interviewed on podcasts, I'm afraid to move. So how do you manage that as an interviewer when you're recording a podcast? It's really tough. <laughs> um, you know, and I do have, I do my intro, my outro, I have my script and I have some questions, but I also try to keep it conversational and I try to listen uh, and, and make sure that I try to stay in the moment and they want me to bring my personality into it. And I'm still learning that. Uh, and sometimes it works more, it works in a way that's more skillful than others, but I know when I've hit it, when you, you listen to them and you bring in a little bit of yourself, but then you also keep them on point. Uh, and also the part of it is how, when someone, as John was saying, is going on and on and on, you want, you don't, you want to, to steer them, cut them short, but also uh, not just come in and, and be very obvious about interrupting them in the middle of giving an answer. Uh, and so uh, it's, it's difficult, but I have my little notes and things and uh, I, I, I try to get good storytellers. Uh, so I have to get them to get their story out, keep it short, and then for me to also jump in when need be. But, but it's, it's very difficult. Now, Ivy has a question. She says, what are some strategies to carry on the interview with someone who is combative? Thinking about Trump walking out of 60 minutes, a lot of that's been happening lately of people are just, okay, this interview is over and I'm gonna walk away. So how do you hold them there if you're having a difficult conversation? Well, you, you know, look, it, 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 you, you can't coddle them so much. If, if they feel they have the power to, um, that they don't care if they look bad by storming off, your job isn't to coddle them. You want to try to keep them going. But, you know, you, you, you can't let petty tyrants determine the, te the, the tone and temper of a conversation. Yeah, I, I've really admired a lot of the African-American women journalists, the Abby Phillips, Yemi Sal Sanders, uh, Kristen Welkers, and so forth, who have been very stalwart in asking those questions. Uh, and sometimes what comes back at them is insult. You know, he's called, he called, you know, I've watched you, you're stupid, or that's not a good question or things like that. And I believe that by staying stalwart and being professional themselves, that they've come out of the exchange. They didn't descend to a certain level. At the same time, they stuck to their question. Okay. And, uh, I, I think that the viewer can see just what's going on. And, uh, and even sometimes, I, you know, in, this, in the debate where, that Kristen Walker was moderating, even Trump had to say, you're doing a good job <laughs> because she was very professional. Uh, in that way. Uh, and I think, you know, I think Chris Wallace has done great work. Um, but I noticed in the debate where at some point he said, I think you're really going to like this question, this next question, Mr. President. And I thought it sounds like you're trying to say, appease someone rather than just ask your question straight. And like I said, I, I admire him. So this is not an insult. And I, I have not done that hard, hard task of doing a presidential, moderating a de presidential debate. Um, and I certainly wouldn't, you know, goodness knows what Trump would call me. But, <laughs> but like I said, I, I do admire those African-American women who have to deal with asking a question while being insulted. John, did you have something to add? No, no I, I, I just, you know, I, I, I think those examples that Mary gave are exactly right. And I do think in general, it, it, look, it's incumbent upon journalists not to get dragged into the fray that way. There, there are different roles you're going to play at different times, particularly if you're in the White House press corps. Um, 
you know, and you have a president who's actively insulting you, you win that debate um, by, by staying above it, but also not being bullied into backing down. Um, and, and, and that's just about strength and, and, and persistence, but it's been a surreally difficult time uh, in that regard. Um, we, we, we've had a president for the first time called journalists the enemy of the people, have an administration that's operated as if that were uh, the case. Um, uh, and of course we're not, we're the defender of the people uh, with regards to uh, not letting people get away from lying uh, let it get away with lying. But, but I do think as, as we try to heal some of the breaches, there is an obligation to rebuild trust, particularly with communities. And that's why local, local conversations and local media is so important. And, and, um, and telling people's stories in a way that, uh, that they feel heard is really important, even and perhaps especially when you, dis you may disagree from a, a columnist POV. Yeah, and I do think that that's when I feel that journalists can do more of the work when you're talking about the policy, talking to the policy makers, that's an interview, but it's really incumbent on you to talk to the people who are affected by the policy and do it with respect. Um, so, you know, if you're, you're doing the story and interviewing doctors about how hard it's gonna be because a lot of African-Americans mistrust the vaccine, it's incumbent on you to talk to people and ask them why and uh, talk to people who have had bad uh, relationships with Health, I just did, moderated a, a series of conversations for the uh, NPR affiliate here on racism in healthcare. And there's a very deep reason for these things. And so it's, it, it, it makes us, it, we have to tell the complete story. So interview the stakeholders as well as the people who are making the policy. And that's not always been the case. So, um, and as far as being insulted, it's interesting. I, I was interviewing this guy who was the head of an organization. They were having their conference, but they found out it was a racist organization. So they canceled, they, the hotel wouldn't do it. And I was interviewing him and he was, there was some other journalists there. And he basically said, I do believe that black people are inferior intellectually. And you know, I was interviewing him and a lot of later the people was like, how did you do that? And well, it, the interview, which was broadcast made him look terrible. And that's where it came in handy that I felt that I was a journalist doing my job. And so I didn't take it personally at all. So, and also, I mean, being an African-American woman in the United States of America, that's not the first time somebody said something awful to me, you know, so. So Suzette says, I once heard a journalist say that she gives a little to get a lot when trying to put an interviewee at ease. How much personal chat do you allow about yourself? And, and how do you uh, prevent from becoming the news? Reporting the news and becoming the news, especially as a journalist, is a very fine line. How do you avoid crossing that line? It's never about me. You know, I'm the journalist always. I've always liked being the outsider looking in. Uh, so if a little bit that I give of myself, it's not, I'm not opening a vein to somebody I'm interviewing. It's just enough to get them to open up. Uh, you know, I'm not gonna lie and make up experiences, but uh, to keep the conversation moving. You know, for instance, I'm talking about housing discrimination and you know, I'll say, you know, I live in a, a house I couldn't have lived in because of restricted covenants you know, before the Fair Housing Act, and, which is true, but it's kind of dispassionate, but it opens up the conversation to the history of you know, restricted covenants. So, but I, you know, I, I, when I say that you make them comfortable, I don't mean that you're their buddy. Yeah, I, I think that, that example is a really good one. I think particularly if you're writing a reported column, and again, journalism is a big umbrella and there's a lot of things that fit under it. Um, but, but I think a risk of intimacy can be a very powerful way to connect with people, your reader, as well as the person you're interviewing. But, but there is that line between, you know, it's not about you, you're telling someone else's story, you're trying to get to the truth, or you're being on air, the audience is advocate. Um, that also is not about you. Um, and again, but you need to be authentic to who you are. Authenticity reads on the page and on screen, uh, and, and, and that's awfully important. Um, but, but you know, so you wanna be authentically yourself, but not think it's all about yourself, because it's not, even when you're writing a column. It's not. 
And it's interesting to use a non-journalism uh, example. When I was doing reporting on all the presidential campaigns, it was so interesting that no matter what political party, with a few exceptions, of course, because we saw some of the insults that people were from, so many people love Michelle Obama. And that's because she was so authentically herself. She wore uh, Princeton and Harvard Law very lightly and people got that. And you saw the genuine, you know, I would be at a very Republican kind of you know, right wing. And if she would come up, someone would say, you know what? I, I could go shopping with her or something like this. And that's really difficult to do. If every politician uh, or journalist had that way of being authentically yourself and conveying that to people, that's gold. Mike Leonard, he would like to know, tell us about a time when you took a misstep that was your fault. Did you save the interview after that? Are there any in the trenches war stories as far as that goes? Hmm. <laughs> Have you ever walked away from an interview and said, oh my word, what did I just do? <laughs> I mean, I don't know that there's been a single interview I've done where I've said, hadn't said, gosh, I really ask, wish I asked that other question that I either didn't get to or you didn't have the right follow. Um, that's, that's table stakes. Yeah, no, that's, that's the question. It was like, oh, I wish I, you know, you know how you always think of the witty comeback when you're, you know, leaving the party. <laughs> it's the, yeah. why didn't I, uh, how come I didn't think of that, whatever. But the moment you stop doing that, as I said, I'm constantly learning uh, and trying to get better. And so, but I, yeah, I have left one and said, oh, why didn't I do that? Or I missed that opportunity, something like that. So when you have these politicians that have their, their talking points, how do you get them to pivot? I know I'm backtracking a little bit here. And, and a, how, how much do you poke and prod before you say, okay, they're just gonna spit out the same sentence over and over again? How do you, how do, you do that, especially in a, in a live interview situation or a podcast when you're like, okay, we can't just go around in circles for the next five minutes? Any tips? I mean, I, I'd say, I, Mary, if you want to please take that. Otherwise, I'm happy to jump in if you want to still collect your thoughts. Uh, yeah, why don't you go in? But um, look, I, I, I think there's a rule of threes. I mean, I think more than three follow-ups is just uh, masochistic or sadistic, uh, and 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 is 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 you know not pleasurable for the audience. Um, and moreover, I think it becomes very clear <laughs> what they're doing. You know, you already won the point if they don't ask a direct answer a direct question three times. Um, I, I think that, uh, again, if you quote people back to themselves and ask them to square the circle, I think that's another way, uh, a, a way out of that. Um, but, but, you know, the baseline needs to be something that um, makes them confront something about themselves, a contradiction, but done in a way that invites an explanation. Um, and, and if they're repeating themselves constantly, you can say, you know, I noticed you've said, for example, the, the Kelly Loeffler uh, uh, debate uh, performance a few nights ago. Um, I actually went through and I counted the number of times she repeated certain phrases. Uh, and they were, you know, 14 times radical, liberal Raphael Warnock to, you know, I was born and raised on a farm. She said that three times. And at some point I sort of said, you know, I, I noticed we've heard that before. Um, it, you know, you, you seem fairly coached. What about the impact of your policies on farmers, you know, for example, you know, uh, pivoted. I, I, asking people something direct that gets them off their talking point, the more specific the question is, um, the more likely you're able to do it. The more you approach something empathetically so it gets their defenses down. The more you ask a question and think really specifically, and I don't always do this, but uh, adequately, um, think really specifically about the frame of the question you ask, because some extent, people respond to that. You know, not, not your intent. The more specific it is, the more difficult to be able to wriggle out of it and default to talking points. And, and I'm not beyond that. That's sometimes I will put myself in. If they, if they give me a bunch of gobbledygook or bureaucratic speak, I'll say, you know, I really 
don't understand what you are saying. Could you tell me exactly what you mean yep. by that? Because it's very confusing to me. Or, you know, or I, call me the lowest common denominator, but I can't get through that. And maybe some of our listeners won't either. So could you break that down? Could you tell me what you mean by that? What, what exactly? What exact? Be, you know, as he said, be specific and demand that they are specific because, you know, those, you can see those talking points coming, you know, and, or even as he said, say, you often say that, but, but what, what is it that that exactly means? And, and what effect is it going to have on people or that kind of thing? It's, <laughs> It's kind of a nice way of saying, you're going to try to get away with that <laughs> again. Um, but, but I often will say that. I'll say, you know, you said that, and I have absolutely no idea what that, that is. That's, a, that's such a charming technique, and I'm sure Mary can pull it off better than, than most. But than me. <laughs> one, other, one other small technique, if they've given you a bunch of gobbledygook to a broad question, like, I'm sorry, I'm not following. Just, just yes or no, do you support raising taxes or not? You know, just whatever the issue may be, just just boil it down to a yes or no. And then if they punt again, the audience is like, oh, yeah, this is just a big yes or And you've seen that used a lot lately where when people would ask about Joe Biden, is he the president elect? And people would start to, you know, say there's some you know, lawsuits out, whatever. And, and journalists would just say, do you accept that Joe Biden has and uh, is elected the president of the United States, and that's when some politicians were outed by like, you still don't accept that. Um, and that was interesting when the Washington Post actually just went to every single Congressperson, <laughs> representative, and senator and asked that point blank. Uh, and that was a story because people had to say yes or no or no answer, and so you knew right ahead what the deal was. Um, yeah. Final question. Um, interviews can be intimidating, especially for journalists and students coming out and um, beginning journalists. Any final thoughts, encouragement on holding our local officials, national officials to account and getting the story when you've got to ask big questions as a small fish in a little city pond? Mary? I would just say, because uh, I was there, I would go into rooms when I was first starting out, whether it's a city council meeting or whatever, and you're asking somebody a question, and I would be young, and I would be a woman, and I would be an African-American, and there would be a lot of people who really would want to dismiss me for any one of those reasons. And the, what I just did was I just, I, and I learned a lot of this through, I worked with folks at the Maynard Institute, where I was in their editing program, and this was a program started by Nancy uh, and Bob Maynard uh, for minority journalists. Now it's really open to everyone. And they really stressed excellence. Be excellent. Just work very hard and have your reporting and have your facts and do your homework and go in there so prepared that you really have that. That's what you have. And that's always stuck with me. Probably made me a little bit of a workaholic. Um, but when I was younger, that really helped get me through that nervousness that is really only natural, is to have it, to know that you have done everything that you can do and, and be professional in every way. Yeah, I, I, I would only add to that that nervousness is normal, particularly when you're starting out. Um, you know, the first time I, I did TV, I was so nervous that my heart was beating so loudly that I didn't even hear the question that was asked to me. Uh, and, and now I seem to do it for a living. So, or at least part of what I do. Um, so, and I would say, look, sometimes being young, a student journalist actually is a massive asset because you may be able to get an interview from folks uh, who, who wouldn't normally say yes, um, either because they're, they're flattered or they're maybe they're, they're at war with a local paper and they'll think that your interview is non-threatening. So then go in, be friendly. Uh, that it matters enormously. Just if you go in in an adversarial way or a humorless way, you're not going to get people to be on defensive from jump. But if you do your homework, as Mary just said, and you go in and you, and you know that the biggest, the, the top three questions you want to ask um, and, and make them specific, you'll get something you can use. And, uh, and that can really make a difference. 
So don't be deterred by the fact that you're young. Just do your homework, be friendly, know what your focus is going to be, um, and, uh, and, and tell the story. Tell the story. Awesome. And trust your gut, I think. Um, I think you have a good, most, a lot, you know, even when I was younger, you kind of get a sense where someone's not being honest or uh, something is off, whether this is in your reporting or in your interviewing or your, your on air. And go with that. Follow that instinct. Um, be a journalist in your personal life too. So know that, you know, if, 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 if you feel something, investigate that. Uh, and you know, often, you know, that, that, that will really lead you to some great work. And I've been really uh, amazed by some incredible work that some student journalists have done all over the country. And uh, I'm on several scholarship committees and things like that. And I am really heartened by uh, the enterprise uh, and the smarts that's going on out there. So more power. If you're a young person coming up and doing those local stories, oh my goodness, you got the world ahead of you. Wonderful. Thank you very much. Mary C. Curtis, John Avalon, I really appreciate you taking an hour of your time tonight. Again, this is Bonnie Jean Feldkamp. I'm with the National Society of Newspaper Columnist. And thank you so much, columnist.com for future events. I appreciate it. Have a good night, everyone. Thank you. Yeah.